Uh, welcome everyone. Happy New Year. Thanks so much for joining us today for this 27th episode of the Clements Bookworm. I'm Angela Unk, Director of Development at the Clements Library. In case you're joining us for the first time, um, I just want to give you a couple of pointers about how we use Zoom for this program. You've probably already noticed that the chat is enabled. We encourage you to continue to chime in. Uh, we'd appreciate it if you select all panelists and attendees so everyone can participate in the conversation together. And you'll notice though that the conversation goes by very quickly. So because of that, please put your questions for Shana in the Q and A section. There you can ask questions. And you can also see the questions that other people are asking. And if you'd like to upload it, you give it a thumbs up and that will send it toward the top of the list. And if you have any comments or answers related to that question, you can also um, put a comment in and it stays right there with that question. So we'll hope you'll participate in that way. In addition, we'll be mentioning a variety of resources throughout this broadcast, and my colleagues Ann Bennington Helber and Tracy Paovich will be um, monitoring the chat and pasting in good information uh, for everyone. As well, you'll notice that we have enabled the live transcription as part of our diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, initiative here at the Clements Library. So you can um, change the size uh, or turn it off if you find it distracting by clicking on um, the live, uh, live captioning icon. So, and if you have any other questions about any of this, you can also uh, put it in chat for Anne or Tracy to troubleshoot. This program is brought to you today by the William L. Clements Library, located on the campus of the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. The Clements Library enables the discovery, learning, and teaching of American history through the collection, conservation, digitization, and availability of primary sources on paper. So we welcome you to this program today. Today's episode is generously sponsored by Duane and Marilyn Kirking. Thank you so much for your sponsorship. All right, everybody. This is your last chance to click on the poll question. So click very quickly and then I will share the results. Um, let's see. All right, share results. Here we go. So we we're talking about uh, fruit today. So we were curious what people's favorite types of fruit are. And it looks like berries have risen to the top with 38% voting for them, as well as apples and pears uh, and stone fruit coming in um, tied for second at 18%. And we're asking people if you know where your favorite fruits are grown. And we have 41% saying yes in my local area. And, and then um, almost everyone has some idea about where the, the fruit might have been grown. And then we also wanted to know if you understand the steps that it takes to grow the fruit and get it to your table. And about 56% of you said yes, and another 44% um, said no. So I think everyone will find this conversation today very fascinating. I know that uh, since doing the dress rehearsal with Shana last week, I have thought about this a lot and I can't wait to hear the presentation again because I know that there will be more for me to consider. So thank you everybody for participating in that. 
Today, I am pleased to welcome Shana Klein to our program. She is the Assistant Professor of Art History at Kent State University and the recipient of several research fellowships from the Smithsonian American Art Museum, the American Council of Learned Societies, the Henry Luce Foundation, and the Georgia O'Keeffe Museum, among others. Her research interests include American visual and material culture, food studies, race and post-colonial studies, and, the, and art and social justice. She holds a PhD in art history from the University of New Mexico, where she completed the dissertation and now book, The Fruits of Empire, Art, Food and Politics of Race in the Age of American Expansion. Welcome. Thank you so much, Angela. I just want to extend my gratitude to Angela, to Anne, and Taylor for helping to organize this. And of course, Paul Erickson, who I see is in attendance. I met Paul years ago when I was a fellow doing this research at the American Antiquarian Society. So he really helped plant the seeds of today's presentation. Oh, thank you. Thanks so much. It's, it's, um, so great to have you here. And I um, thought maybe you could tell people a little bit more about what you told me about how you're donating the royalties of your book. Sure, so I wanna be very clear. I am not making a penny from this book and not that academic books are that lucrative to begin with, but I'm certainly not making a cent from this. Everything is going to be donated to the Coalition of Immokalee Workers. So this is an organization that I support that is devoted to ensuring the civil rights for our farm workers, for the people who grow our food, uh, particularly the workers in Immokalee, Florida. And the CIW is really committed to the fair food program, which is trying to ensure better working conditions and fair pay for workers who grow foods for our grocery stores and our fast food chain restaurants. And it's a nationally recognized organization. And I just felt like it was aligned with what I'm trying to do with my book. My book is all about trying to recover the voices and histories that have been silenced or uh, marginalized, and it did not feel ethical to be making any sort of profit from this. Thank you, thank you. I just, that's really wonderful. Um, I think too, the other thing that I'm really interested in um, having you share with people is, what sparked your interest in studying American expansion through the lens of art and food? Yeah, that's a great question. So it all started with my education at the University of New Mexico. I'm very proud to have my PhD from that institution because they are pioneering in Latin American, Native American art histories, histories that a lot of curriculum uh, do not address throughout the United States. And so I took a class on Central American art history there. And that's where I was exposed to the work of Moises Barrios. So I think there's a next slide. Moises Barrios did the cover for my book. I used his artwork for my cover. And he's a contemporary Guatemalan artist. And he talks about how the system of the banana trade has been so lopsided and has been a really sordid history of US intervention and ruthless politics. And in this painting in particular, he shows American fighter jets landing on bananas as if to claim and defend this territory as their own. And it got me thinking how the edible is political, right? Food is so political. And what might that mean in a lot of the still life paintings and images of food that I was studying in the late 19th century in American art? And once I saw the politics of one food, I couldn't unsee it. It was like everywhere. Everything just kind of opened up for me and I ran with it. Well, I am so glad that you have. And uh, I think you should take it away and tell people more about your book. Sure. Um, thanks again for attending everyone. So I'll just give you a brief introduction into my book called The Fruits of Empire by saying that while this uh, topic might sound light and fun, right? Foods must have been delicious to paint. They must have been mouthwatering to look at in art. I actually explore the darker side, the darker politics of food and art and how they reflected national attitudes about race, 
about the expansion of the American empire. Fruit in particular pressed upon these ideas because fruit was being grown in places that many Americans wanted to conquer or to colonize. And the people who were harvesting fruit, people of color, immigrant laborers, they were also the targets of racism and they were the subject of debates over citizenship. So I look at representations of food and the politics of food and art in Florida, California, Hawaii. This is historically where a lot of our semi-tropical fruits are grown. These are also places where historically um, our historians have not really spent a lot of attention on. Um, I'm in a field that is really dominated by a canon focused on the Northeast, New York, New England. And so um, I'm hoping that my book also does a service to artists and image makers who were located in other areas of the country that warrant more investigation. And so today's talk, we're gonna be looking at food and art across paintings, photographs, World's Fair exhibits. And so I, I hope to take you on um, quite a journey. This first image that we're looking at is of the grape. So my book is divided into five chapters that are each divided by a specific fruit. So I have a chapter on the grape, orange, watermelon, banana, and pineapple. I chose these fruits because they were the most frequently represented in art or they were the most obviously political foods that stimulated conversations about race and citizenship. So my first chapter is on the California grape we're looking at kind of a quirky image of the world's largest, longest record, great, record breaking grapevine that was shipped from Santa Barbara, California to Philadelphia for the Philadelphia Centennial. Why was this done? Well, World's Fairs were a very attractive venue for people to flaunt the accomplishments of their region, to flaunt the accomplishments of their area. And it's in the late 1800s when we start to see the rise of the California grape and wine industry. So previously, the Center for Grape Culture had been in New York, then it moved to Ohio. By the late 1800s, California emerges as a, a budding industry. So think of Napa Valley today or Sonoma County. That all started in the 1800s. And World's Fair exhibits like this one were basically billboards. Think of them as billboards or advertisements for California as now the new center for grape culture. And these record-breaking grapevine exhibits were all intended to encourage investment in California grapes, to encourage migration to California, um, and really advertising the rich resources of the Western frontier. Now, because World's Fairs were such an attractive venue for uh, showing and touting the accomplishments of each region, it's no surprise that you know almost 20 years later, in the next slide, you can see another exhibit of California grapes now at the Columbian Exposition in Chicago. So in 1893 in Chicago, this example I think is a really explicit connection between fruits, visual images and national expansion because what we're looking at is an image from the exhibit that showed shelves and shelves of California wines that are underneath this panoramic view of the western frontier specifically the San Francisco Bay and then above that image was a banner stating westward the star of empire takes its way so that star of empire is definitely the grape the California grape in this instance and so these World's Fair venues continue to be advertisements for uh, more uh, investment in California grapes and wine, showing how it was a very large export industry, but also they were linked in rhetoric about national expansion. There's a lot of literature from this time period saying that cultivating grapes, cultivating vineyards in the Western frontier was a way of colonizing that landscape in a way of, quote, civilizing the Western frontier. And so there's a larger mission attached to grapes as a way to transform the West and claim the West, as if growing grapes uh, was this kind of divine mission bestowed upon white American people. So think of grapes as like the new gold of the late 1800s. So what's interesting about a lot of the research that I did on California grapes is that rarely do you actually see images of people laboring the grapes or creating the wine. 
What we're looking at now is an exception to that rule. So this was an illustration published in Harper's Weekly, a widely read journal by Paul Frenzeni. He showed how many of the laborers of this industry were Chinese immigrants. So we see people stomping grapes using new grape crushing machines. Now, what I found really striking was that there were a number of readers who saw this illustration and wrote in commentaries lambasting this illustration, racist commentary saying that they did not want to see Chinese laborers stomping grapes with their quote, filthy, dirty feet. So I take a pause here to encourage everyone to think about how representations of food became this platform for uh, people to consider who is consuming their food, who was laboring their food, and really became this platform for racist debates and anxieties about who should have the privilege of harvesting America's fruit lands. And so the grape I use as this introduction in my book to introduce readers to how foods were racially charged. My next chapter takes people from California to the Florida orange industry. So we're crossing the country to go to Florida with a chapter on the Florida orange. And I feel like most people who pick up my book, they might be attracted to the flashier chapters on the banana or the pineapple. But my favorite chapter is this orange chapter. This is where, in my mind, I make the most mind-blowing discoveries. <laughs> so. Um, I hope you'll be interested in reading it. This is um, a chapter where I helped to discover that the Florida orange industry was not spearheaded by Southerners, but by Northerners. So many Northerners are moving to the South after the Civil War, and they are looking to make money, to also uh, cultivate more political influence in the South in the era of Reconstruction and oranges are really an assistant to this mission. So Northerners are moving to the South. They're trying to rehabilitate the South. And also in a way of uh, cultivating oranges, they're hoping to steer the Southern economy away from those plantation-based uh, businesses that were stained with the history of slavery. So they claim that by creating orange groves, this would be a more uh, democratic industry than uh, tobacco or cotton or rice. Now, I'm not certain whether the orange industry was any more benevolent or equitable, but this is what Northerners who are moving South after the Civil War are saying in favor of cultivating oranges apart from other Southern goods. Many Northerners are also hiring newly freed African-Americans, African-Americans who had been emancipated after the Civil War. And so they also see the orange industry as a method of racial uplift. They're pretty condescending and patronizing about it, but they are uh, hiring newly freed African-Americans in order to pave a new pathway of opportunity and, and uh, a new economic possibility for African-Americans who had been uh, oppressed in these other industries. Now, one of my favorite um, discoveries in this chapter is the role that Harriet Beecher Stowe plays in the orange industry. There have been some scholars before me who have talked about how Stowe was really unusual and that she owned her own orange grove. I mean, isn't that incredible? She owned her own orange grove. That's very unconventional for a woman. And it shows how after the Civil War, women are really expanding their role um, outside the domestic sphere. Stowe even had crate labels advertising her orange grove in Florida. And I also examine how Stowe was a painter. We all know about Harriet Beecher Stowe as the best-selling author of Uncle Tom's Cabin. She also was an outspoken abolitionist, but did you know that she also painted? She took the hobby of painting very seriously. I mean, she trained for hours at a time. She painted several depictions of Florida fruits and flowers, and she even donated some of her orange paintings to uh, give money to African-American churches in Florida. So oranges are a really useful device for Stowe to, to try to politically influence the South, to try to rehabilitate the Southern economy, and to advertise the Florida orange in these paintings that she's exhibiting back up North. 
Um, the next slide, you can also see um, more about how women are shaping national expansion in this time period. So much attention gets paid to the histories of men as fruit entrepreneurs, men using food and shaping American politics and commerce, but women are doing it too. Women would have purchased a souvenir set such as this one. I think this is such a quirky ceramic set. We have saucers and plates that are uh, shaped in the shape of a Florida orange, branded with the word Florida and black. They uh, resemble the dimpled rind of the citrus fruit. So women would have displayed this in their dining room. And so this was another way of supporting the South after the Civil War, of trying to bring more attention, more money to the Florida orange industry. And even if women weren't so deliberate in having that motivation by displaying the souvenir set, they were still sending support to that cause by uh, having this uh, object in their dining room, by painting the Florida orange, I also found many recipes incorporating the Florida orange in cookbooks after the Civil War. So this was really a, a literal and kind of metaphorical way of folding the South back into the Union in the era of Reconstruction and the ways in which women were powerfully impacting this industry. The next image shows how I also consider photography in this moment. So we see a lot of images of orange groves. This one shows African-American men in the foreground who are picking oranges, who are overseeing the orange trade. And that also shows again that this new industry uh, was designed to provide a new pathway of opportunity for newly freed African-Americans. And a lot of these images, they show romantic views. They show a picturesque view of orange labor when in reality, Orange picking is hard work. It's backbending work. It's dangerous work. You're at the heights of a ladder. Um, and so there's a kind of glossing over of the labor that was involved in the actual industry. But I use this as another example to show how uh, whether or not the orange industry was actually so uplifting or benevolent, it really was touted as this uh, kind of optimistic new opportunity for people in the new South. My next chapter is on the watermelon. I feel like I should have a trigger warning in here because this is certainly my darkest chapter in my book project. And this is a chapter that deals with the watermelon stereotype. So a vicious, cruel stereotype that develops not in the 20th century, but in the 19th century that claims African-Americans have this insatiable lust for watermelon. So I can show you hundreds of images of black men and women salivating over the fruit, lusting after the fruit, stealing the fruit from gardens. We're looking at here a trade card image of a black man who has transformed into the fruit, so obsessed with the fruit that his whole face becomes the green rind of the watermelon and his smile mimics the crescent shape of the fruit. These images were so pervasive. I mean, I cannot, uh, exaggerate how pervasive they were. In all of my archival research, I found the watermelon stereotype on images in California, Chicago, both the North and the South. The best adjective that I can use to describe the ubiquity of this stereotype is that racist watermelon imagery was relentless. Like that is a big takeaway from my today's lecture. If you take anything away, it's that these images were relentless. And so, you know, I had some uh, internal dilemmas about whether or not to include these images in my book and whether or not to include them in my presentation today because I don't wanna perpetuate this history, of course, but I found that in the course of my research, a lot of my uh, particularly white readers and white scholars who I was discussing this research with, they weren't aware of the watermelon stereotype. And so I felt that it was necessary to confront this racist history to chart the emergence of the stereotype in order to understand how these images were designed for racist ends. They were designed to show African-American people as um, an inferior race, to show African-Americans as a savage people um, who were not fit for citizenship. And that's important in the context of the Reconstruction and Jim Crow era after years that they have 
granted, um, they've been granted the privileges of citizenship. And these images were trying to work against that. I see a question in the chat about why this card was produced for the Boston Dental Association. Trade cards were often used um, with images that are sometimes related or not related to the industry. Uh, we can talk more about that in the Q&A session, uh, but certainly scholars wonder if maybe the sweetness of watermelon is somehow connected to um, trying to advertise people maybe to you know, not eat so much sugar in order to maintain their dental hygiene. It's something we can certainly address at the end of the conversation. So while I can show you hundreds, probably thousands of racist images of the watermelon, it is way more rewarding for me to show you how artists may have been using art to combat that stereotype, to, to tear it apart. And so I use the example of Charles Ethan Porter. Porter is one of the uh, few African-American artists of the 1800s to gain uh, recognition in the art world. He had an illustrious still life career and out of his still life career, he only paints two images of the broken watermelon, two images of watermelon. So as a black artist painting watermelon, I mean, what must that have been like? Such a racially loaded object. Um, I think it's telling that he only paints it twice, right? He probably wants to avoid it. But when he does paint it, he actually treats it in a very unconventional manner. This is not your polite, genteel dining room painting of watermelon. He is showing a level of violence in the painting. Would you agree? We see the watermelon broken apart, torn into chunks. Um, it has been ravaged on the ground. We have watermelon seeds that have been knocked out onto the ground that look almost like teeth. There is a level of violence that has some precedence in earlier watermelon imagery, um, but it certainly makes me wonder how a black artist would negotiate the watermelon when in mainstream culture, it was this racist proxy for black people. And so I wonder if he's using still life painting to comment on racial violence in this time period. This is uh, something that other artists are doing as well. In my book, I give other examples about how artists may have been attracted to the still life genre as a method of tackling more sensitive subjects like social and racial abuses that would have been way too controversial to depict more overtly in a, in a, a figurative depiction. Another example I give is with Carrie Mae Weems. This is one of my favorite images in the book. It was also my most expensive, but it was worth every penny. <laughs> Carrie Mae Weems is a contemporary artist, and here she shows a photograph of a black man holding watermelon. Here's a man who is standing tall, dignified. Uh, he is in control of his emotions. He doesn't show any of the caricatured characteristics in past watermelon images, right? We don't see a person with buggy eyes or that uh, crescent shaped watermelon smile. Uh, he's also holding a watermelon that is uncut, right? As if he's refusing to open up the watermelon to all of its racist interpretations. And my favorite part about this photograph is actually the background. I love how Weems shows us the wrinkled backdrop and then at the very top of the composition, you can also see windows or skylights in the background. To me, this is Weems signaling the artifice of these images. That throughout American history, watermelon images have been so carefully constructed. They have been so manufactured. And she makes us keenly aware about, of this by showing us the artifice that goes behind these images. All right, my fourth chapter takes us into the 20th century with a chapter on the banana. And so we continue to look at how the banana taps into debates about race and citizenship. But first, it's important to understand that the banana was not mainstream until really the very last years or the first years of the 20th century. Um, and so the banana was considered a foreign and exotic fruit most Americans probably had never tasted a banana until the last decades of the 19th century. So I use this painting as an example by John George Brown to show some of the earliest encounters we have with um, American people consuming the fruit. We have this sweet image of a boot black, a young boy who's holding the banana. He looks so excited to get this fruit, which was probably 
way above his budget or allowance to be able to afford that fruit. And he's also holding it upside down to suggest that perhaps he's so unfamiliar with the fruit that he doesn't know how to eat it or he doesn't know where to, un where to peel it. Um, and so these paintings actually provide some documentation of Americans' early experiences with this fruit. There are even um, some, some uh, articles I read that Americans mistook the banana for sausages. Now that might sound really strange, like how could you confuse a yellow banana with a sausage? But we have to remember that in the 1800s, Americans ate a different variety of the banana than we eat today. So today we eat the Cavendish. It's a slimmer, a slender banana. Apparently it's a lot less delicious than the Gros Michel banana, which Americans ate in the 1800s. That was stouter, thicker, fatter, and again, more delicious. I like wish I could try a Gros Michel banana. They're um, pretty rare from my understanding today. So we see some of these earlier encounters with the fruit. And then by the 20th century, with the next slide, you can see the United Fruit Company is helping to make the banana more mainstream. So the United Fruit Company is starting to corporatize the fruit they are setting down banana groves in Central America and the Caribbean, and they are widely improving access for American consumers to be able to eat the Central American, the Caribbean banana. I analyzed several of the earliest advertisements and cookbooks for the United Fruit Company, but my role as an art historian is not just to read what's in the image. It's not just to read what we're looking at in the composition, but it's also to interpret what we don't see in the image. What has been written out of the picture plane? What do these images betray? What kind of realities, what truthfulness do they not show? And for many of those listening, you might be familiar with the history of the United Fruit Company, which was simply and plainly ruthless. Okay, these images, they edit out all of the violence and devastation that the United Fruit Company caused in Latin America, including environmental devastation, political instability. They also stole land from indigenous farmers. <clears throat> the United Fruit Company even instituted coups. I'll, I'll say that again. They had coups, political coups that were supported by the CIA to maintain control over the landscapes and the politics where they set down banana groves. And so I look at how um, the United Fruit Company either addressed or did not address in most cases, the consequences of their interference abroad. And I also look at how contemporary artists are looking back to this history and addressing it today in their art. So I'll give another example of the work by Moises Barrios, the same painter who did the image for my book cover. <coughs> Excuse me. So Barrios, he also paints the display windows of the clothing store Banana Republic. He paints the display windows, the mannequins of Banana Republic clothing stores in the United States as a way to encourage viewers to think about why are we romanticizing banana republics? Even the term banana republic is itself pejorative. And he makes us question, why is there a clothing company named after this system that has caused so much political instability, that has caused so much wreckage? And in this depiction, you might see in the background, there's actually a reflection of a man selling bananas. So Barrios urges us to consider, how do we wear the banana? How do we consume the banana? And at whose expense? The next chapter, and I'll end the conversation with this last section on the pineapple, it continues to take us deeper into the 20th century and also the continued corporatization of fruit with the Dole Hawaiian Pineapple Company. And once again, we see World's Fair exhibits. These were some of the earliest advertisements for the Hawaiian pineapple, a fruit, by the way, that was not indigenous to Hawaii. That's how good dull marketing is, right? We Maybe a lot of us think that pineapples are natural or indigenous to Hawaii. They're not. Um, some of the earliest advertisements were at World's Fair exhibits. And you can see um, on the right-hand side of the composition, there was this two-story tall installation, this huge sculpture of a, a large pineapple 
that's made up of individual pineapples. And I love these really quirky fruit installations that you would have seen at World's Fairs. They're also a subject that should not be neglected because you have to think that a lot of Americans didn't have the resources to travel to Hawaii. It took so much money and a time. You know, it took days upon days to travel overseas to Hawaii. And so this would have been their first look and their first taste of a Hawaiian pineapple at these World's Fair exhibits. And so they were very uh, uh, important to forming ideas in American minds about what Hawaii looked like and what Hawaiian culture was about. It's a very manufactured and narrow vision of Hawaiian culture. Um, in the next image, you'll see that the Dole Hawaiian Pineapple Company was really a leader in using artists to work with their um, advertising campaigns. And so the pineapple is actually another great and explicit example of how fruit, art, and national expansion worked in concert because leaders of the Dole Hawaiian Pineapple Company were working directly with artists and politicians to lobby for more investment in Hawaiian goods and to lobby for Hawaiian incorporation, for Hawaii to be incorporated as our 50th state. I'll tell you briefly the story about the friction between Georgia O'Keeffe and Dole. So Dole, they hire famed artist Georgia O'Keeffe to work on their campaign. They send her to Honolulu, they send her to Hawaii. She's there for about two or three months. And during her time there, she requests to stay on a pineapple plantation. Dole rejects the request, probably because they don't want her staying with laborers because they are not providing great working conditions for the people who are harvesting and canning their pineapples. O'Keefe is probably bitter about this rejection. And during her whole time in Hawaii, she never once paints a pineapple, which is exactly why she was there. Instead, she comes home painting a papaya, which was Dole's adversary. In the end, Dole ships a pineapple to O'Keefe's apartment in Manhattan, and this is what she produces. Um, in her characteristically abstract style, we see this beautiful painting of a budding Dole pineapple. This is what they used for their advertisement. It then later hung um, in the Dole headquarters in San Francisco. Um, but it shows how image makers were not always in support of expansion. They're not always in support of the corporatization of fruit or the systems of power behind fruit. That you know, some artists and image makers are, are bumping up against these systems um, or you know, even more clearly resisting the systems of power in these instances. Um, in the next slide, I also talk about how the Dole Hawaiian Pineapple Company, among other companies, uh, often showed indigenous Hawaiians, Asian Hawaiians as you know, very happy, pleasant people in a time period when there were actually many Americans who were worried about incorporating Hawaii and who were worried about the people who were cultivating Hawaiian pineapples for the American public. Uh, many Americans, including a number of congressmen are on record saying that they do not think we should incorporate Hawaii as a 50th state because they believe that Hawaiians are too, quote, racially incompatible and culturally different from Americans on the, quote, mainland. And so I think a lot of these images work in service of trying to show Hawaiians as a friendly people, as a people who are fit for American citizenship, and especially in this really quirky image that I found in the archive, we're looking at a Hawaiian woman with a pineapple on her sleeve, a pineapple barrette in her hair. She's almost bowing down in reverence to this dull Hawaiian pineapple shaped water tank in Honolulu, as if to suggest that Hawaiian people are in allegiance to dull and therefore uh, in allegiance to the United States. And so these are some of the topics that I address in my book, how images of food are not so innocent, they are not so straightforward, that they are thoughtfully crafted to um, you know, create larger conversations about race, citizenship, and the formation of the American empire. Thank you, Shana. Thanks so much. Yeah, I really look forward to the, the feedback and any you know, questions or comments that you may have. 
Definitely. And I see that several people have put questions in the Q&A section. Okay. So if, if people missed it, please be sure to add your questions to the Q&A section and we'll get to those in just a couple of minutes. I wanted to ask you one question that we often uh, ask authors. Um, was there something that you came across that didn't make it into the book? Oh, certainly, um, right? There's like so many images that um, often don't get included. I think that uh, one of the images that comes to mind is a still life painting I found with honeycomb. So I have spent so many years looking at still life representations of food and honeycomb is just a really rare inclusion in a still life painting. And so when I found this honeycomb painting uh, by Robert Duncanson, an African-American artist of the 1800s, uh, I thought it was so strange. And as I was doing more research on the honeycomb, I realized that in Cincinnati, Ohio, where Duncanson was painting, honey was touted by abolitionists as a friendlier, more ethical alternative to slave produced sugar. And so many abolitionists were encouraging people to eat honeycomb, to not eat refined sugar that was produced abroad uh, by slave labor in order to boycott slave labored industries. And so while this didn't make it into the book, I was able uh, to squeeze it into an article that I wrote in 2015 for the journal American Art on the racial implications of painting honeycomb in the antebellum period. Interesting, thank you. Um, the other thing that I'm wondering about is, are you working on a new project, a new book project? I am. So um, even though I probably could use a little scholarly vacation, <laughs> given that this book was just produced weeks ago, the semester is ramping up again. Um, I'm really excited about my next project. I want to stay in the arena of art history and food studies um, and specifically look at images of milk. Now, not just any milk. I'm actually really interested in breast milk because when I was in the archive, I came across these really haunting and unusual photographs of Victorian women who are looking straight at the camera as they are nursing, as they are breastfeeding their child. And I just thought that was so strange to be showing yourself doing this activity in the Victorian period when even displaying your ankle was considered impolite. Um, so I think my next project will somehow deal with the visual culture of milk and motherhood and if anyone is familiar with these images or have, have any tips for me, you know, I'm happy to absorb those. Wow, yeah, so that, that's a, a great topic. So that'll be really interesting. Thanks. So I am just going to do a couple of housekeeping uh, announcements and then we'll get to the Q&A section. I see lots of good questions uh, popping up in there. So uh, continue to put your questions in there. Next month, uh, February 19th, our bookworm will be joined. Um, I'll be joined by Samantha Hill, the 2019 through 21 Joyce Bonk Fellow at the Clemens Library and our curator of graphics, Clayton Lewis. They'll be talking about the um, new online exhibit, Framing Identity, Representations of Empowerment and Resilience in the Black Experience. So I hope you will all join me, join us again next month. Once you sign up for the bookworm, uh, until you cancel, you are registered for all of the upcoming sessions. So if you're unable to join us live, you will also receive an email after the event with a link to the recording and any resources that are discussed during that program. In addition, I just want to say thank you once again to Dwayne and Marilyn Kirking for sponsoring today's episode of The Bookworm. If you're interested in sponsoring a future episode, please contact myself or Ann Bennington, Bennington Helper uh, to do so. And in addition, as um, you may know, it takes money to uh, make our acquisitions and to conserve and to provide fellowships. So if you feel so inclined, 
we would love to welcome you to our community of donors, the Clements Library Associates. All right, let me hit exit here and stop, whoops, stop share is what I really want. There we go. Okay, so all of these wonderful questions. Yeah, Angela, I'm just reading all of them now. I hope we have time to answer all of them because these are like such important questions and I'm so um, overwhelmed by the quality of the questions. Like you guys are asking really thought provoking questions here. Yes, good, good. Yes, we, we will answer them as long as you are able to stay with us. Okay. <laughs> Um, Chris is asking, what, if any, is the relationship between 20th century sentiments and connotations of the pineapple and earlier colonial ones? I asked this question from Williamsburg, Virginia, which thanks to colonial world, Williamsburg has no shortage of 18th century invocations of pineapple. Yeah, Chris, you're absolutely right. Um, I'm also recently moved to Ohio from Washington, DC. And even at Mount Vernon, there was a pineapple mirror that I saw in George Washington's estate. The pineapple was very popular in um, early colonial America. It was first a representation of hospitality that we borrowed from Europeans because Europeans had pineapples plastered on their plates, their, their mugs, their saucers, um, their doorposts. It was kind of like the, a, a socialization object, something that many visitors would have seen. And so it transforms into this object of entertainment and hospitality. And so it is not uncommon to see it um, in colonial American material culture, but it is certainly an object also of colonial enterprise. So the pineapple um, would have been seen often in botanical engravings of European explorers who were depicting the pineapple in these engravings um, in Latin America to then send back home to European viewers. And they were analyzing the pineapple like they were documenting the flora and fauna of these quote exotic places. And so there are certainly colonial implications to uh, you know, how Europeans address this fruit and then how Americans take on the legacy, the colonial legacy of the pineapple in their own way by importing it to Hawaii and carving out their own industry uh, around an exotic Hawaiian culture. Interesting, thank you so much. And uh, also Chris, if you're interested, there's a great history of the pineapple by George Okihiro. I also um, cite him in my research. Um, so Tom is asking, are the geographic impacts of climate change today changing the political and economic dynamics of fruit culture? Yes, absolutely. Um, and while I'm probably not an expert on the topic to talk about some of those impacts, I will say that there have been New York Times articles and PR articles about how our banana is in danger. Like it is going to be extinct in the near future. There's a lot of fear and anxiety around the destruction of the Cavendish banana because the banana is, um, in my understanding, an asexual fruit. And we have produced a monolithic uh, culture around the banana in which um, it has been vulnerable to diseases and viruses. And if you know, this variety is wiped out. We don't have many other options in terms of what we're currently consuming. And so uh, there is certainly a close connection between the way we're treating our climate, between um, environmental sustainability, and also the startling and scary sustainability matters of our fruit industries. Thank you. Um, Peter is wondering, uh, any other fruits uh, should who get honorable mention that you wish to include in this book but couldn't or plan to work on moving forward? Another great question. So I address this in the conclusion of my book that while I have chosen these five fruits in my topic because they are the most um, overtly political, they seem to stimulate the most obviously political conversations. That is not to say that representations of raspberries or tomatoes don't warrant investigation. They absolutely do. And so I hope this book is really just a starting off point for more scholars to consider the histories of food and drink and how political they are 
across countries, across cultures and time periods. Thank you. How did native Hawaiians respond to this visual pineapplization of Hawaii, especially in the service of incorporating Hawaii into the US? That is such an amazing question. And I wanna be really clear in my answer. The American Hawaiian pineapple companies in Hawaii would not have been uh, created without the implications of native genocide. Like those companies are built on the foundation of indigenous genocide and the theft of indigenous land in Hawaii and the devastation that was wrought upon indigenous culture that paved the way for American entrepreneurs like Dole to um, take that land and to monetize it. And so the consequences were so great upon indigenous communities in Hawaii, and that should not be glossed over. And the legacy of indigenous removal continued throughout the 20th century um, when there were debates about Hawaiian annexation and uh, Hawaiian incorporation again, excluding a lot of indigenous voices from the conversation. And so uh, the migration to Hawaii and the appropriation, or really just, just say theft, the theft of that land is what um, made the Hawaiian pineapple industry what it is today. Thank you. Um, Diane says, you mentioned the archive in relationship to the images of Victorian era women breastfeeding. Can you be more specific about what library and or scholarly resources and locations you consulted? Yeah, so some of these images are in the Schlesinger Library at Harvard. Um, I wonder if there are images at Winterthur Library as well. I've seen a lot of these images um, also now um, across the internet as well. And so um, I haven't quite located an archival source, um, but I also wonder if the George Eastman house might have some of these photographs. Um, any of the archives that really value preserving images of American women and women's histories is where I'm going to go in order to study this subject. Great, thanks. Um, Rex says, how might O'Keeffe's painting differ from a botanical painting? Hers seems to lack the top, yet emphasize the blossom, the feminine in nature showing love for it in all of her floral depictions. Yes, um, I don't know if we have an opportunity to revisit that image, but um, you know, I mentioned that it's in O'Keeffe's characteristically abstract style. So we have these uh, broad areas of color, a kind of flat two-dimensionality. We have these striations of stripes and colors. Um, and what I was really interested in this image is that it's almost a deviation from most images that exoticize Hawaiian people and Hawaiian goods. We don't see any of the stereotypes of Hawaiian women half naked wearing flowers in their hair reduced and objectified to their sexuality. It's almost as if O'Keeffe has purposely emancipated her image of the pineapple to not include any figurative people um, as if to really reduce the object just to the pure forms and the aesthetic conditions of the pineapple. And so I wonder if that's deliberate. You know, I don't think O'Keeffe was maybe so uh, careful in terms of how she edited her depiction, but I do think that it is worth noting that her image is a deviation from how most images of the Hawaiian pineapple looked and the people who, uh, the Hawaiian people who accompanied a lot of these exoticizing images. Thank you. While I have this open, um, I see two other questions relating to images. So uh, Victoria is wondering about the image of the dental card um, because it has what or melon printed at the top left corner yeah. and wondering what the significance of that is. So trade card history is really interesting. Trade cards and chromolithography were new developments and inventions in the 19th century. Color chromolithography doesn't really take off until after the Civil War. And so a lot of trade cards, which were like 
think of them as small business cards that you would hand out um, when you see someone or they could have been distributed as part of catalogs. Um, they had a limited bank of images to choose from in order to advertise their industry. So oftentimes you see an image on that trade card that has really little to do with the business that's being advertised. But the intention of choosing an image for your trade card was to grab a person's attention, right? That's what commercials still do today. It's all about <clears throat> quickly getting someone's attention so that they can pay attention to your business. And so using kind of campy, quirky things like watermelon or using this like very bright and colorful, albeit racist image of a man transforming into watermelon would have been a commercial avenue of trying to grab the consumer's attention. Right. And um, I feel like there was something else that that while you were discussing it, you said, let's come back to that during the, the Q&A with this yeah, image. I think that was this image. So hopefully that answers some of those questions. Oh, all right, so I just wanted to make sure. And I cool. see that there's also a question. Oh, I think I'm going the wrong way. Um, about this image and wondering about the banana peel on the ground. Does that show that he's already eaten one? Yes, so um, it certainly indicates that he would have already had a banana consumed. And also there were uh, several stories and tales about the slippery banana peel. That was definitely part of mainstream American culture at this moment in the 19th century. You can read stories about how people were slipping over banana peels, falling on the ground. It was a humorous tale, a humorous genre of art and literature. Um, but one that was also kind of like a morality lesson to suggest that people should be more in control of their bodies um, so as to not get too excited or overly exert themselves and slip on these peels. They were basically like Victorian lessons on how to properly behave and how to contain your emotions and your um, physical movement. Thank you. Um... I see that people are discussing, and you covered this a little bit in the climate change question, but Tom was talking about um, having bananas in Southeast Asia and how, wondering why we don't have those kinds. And I see a couple of answers about not shipping well. Um, do you have any more comments on that? Sure, I should also say that um, one of the reasons that we had access to the banana as you know early as the 1800s is because of refrigeration. Like you cannot talk about the history of fruit in this country without revolutions in ice and refrigeration. That's what makes these industries possible. And so um, if you, uh, you know, really want to understand the history of fruit, you have to think about how it's being industrialized in this time period and that we are allowed shipment from California oranges to people in New York because of refrigeration. So that's all I would do to expand on that question. Thank you, thanks. Um, all right, so Michaela is asking about the organization of your book project. Is she um, wondering if you could speak about the challenges of weaving the stories of different fruits together between distinct chapters? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, <clears throat> this was a really challenging topic to work on. I'm envious of many of my friends who work on one artist in one time period. That is not what my book was like. My book is so unwieldy in, in, in that sense because I'm looking at so many different food histories and then I'm also constantly shuttling back to the histories of the visual images of those foods. So it's like this schizophrenic experience I had and trying to navigate a lot of different disciplines, a lot of different methodologies and shuffling back and forth between the food and the image of the food. And so, um, I've lost my train of thought. The question was about how I organized the book. Is that right? And, and how you um, interweave the stories between the different kinds of fruit. Yeah, so it was um, a, a constant kind of battle, but also a reminder that at the core of my book is the visual image. 
So this is not just a book about the histories of the foods. It's a book about how visual representations of foods function. Because oftentimes, and food study scholars don't take images seriously enough, oftentimes, a lot of Americans saw the fruit in a visual image before they ever tasted it or encountered it. And so we have to take visual images of food much more seriously because they were so ubiquitous, they were so pervasive, and this like first point of contact for a lot of Americans before they actually consumed the food. Right. Paul is asking, in the same period that you're covering, were there fruits that came to be seen as quintessentially American alongside this focus on fruits that were viewed as exotic? I'm thinking of the emergence of the legend of Johnny Appleseed, but also the contemporary interest in heritage agricultural products of all kinds that are somehow seen as being more authentic. Yeah, first of all, hi Paul, so good to interact with you. Thanks again for your support. Um, and Paul's question is so good and so important because I think one of the questions that people uh, will ask upon reading my book is, where's the apple, right? Where is the apple in this research? Because historically that has been touted as the most quintessential, the most democratic American fruit. Um, in my understanding, apples are not indigenous to the United States. They were actually brought over here in the colonial time period with European settlers. Um, but the reason why I don't include the apple in this book is because uh, this book is all about national expansion and uh, initiatives to expand our borders. And if apples had become mainstream and quintessential American fruits by the late 1800s, it didn't strike a conversation about national expansion. I think a history and the politics of the apple is so important, maybe prior to this time period. Um, but Paul is right to point out that while some fruits were considered foreign and exotic and stimulated conversations about who should have the privilege of harvesting those foods, there were other foods that were considered mainstream and indigenous um, and as these ambassadors for American culture. Thank I'll you. Specifically say apples make for an interesting conversation about temperance because a lot of apples were cultivated not to eat raw, but for cider. And so there were many temperance supporters who were like, don't cultivate apples, you know, they, they are sinful, they're lawless, and they'll, you know, encourage you to, you know, drink alcohol in a sense. Um, and so the history of apple cultivation, I uh, saw a question about Johnny Appleseed too, is another conversation about indigenous removal and the theft of Native American land for cultivating orchards. Um, a lot of people don't connect these conversations of temperance and uh, indigenous genocide to the history of apples in America. Right. Um, thank you. So Jesse uh, says, can you discuss narratives of race in the American populist movement before the turn of the century? Despite the fact that the populist movement ultimately made a turn to white supremacy in the 20th century, there was no doubt an interracial movement of poor farmers and laborers in opposition to agricultural monopolies. Um, and then going on to talk about India today, uh, struggling in similar ways. Yeah, so like I mentioned in my presentation, um, I can show so many more images in support of national expansion, um, images that support the uh, kind of you know, racist uh, anxieties about those who are cultivating our food, but it is much more inspiring to me to show the grassroots organizations and the people and the communities who are trying to resist these uneven systems of power. And so I don't know if I'm answering your question accurately, but I do want to point out that, of course, there's the United Farm Workers Movement um, that's in, you know, throughout American history, farm workers communities that have been uh, working against corporations and trying to ensure better conditions and fairer wages for the people who harvest our food. And once again, women played an important role in the United Farm Workers Movement. Someone like Dolores Huerta um, and uh, the women who also led protests against the great boycotts of the 1960s. We have a long history of food boycotts and resistance to food companies and um, food conditions in this country. 
uh, that I, I hope my book will continue the legacy of just through the lens of art. Do, do those organizations use art as well? Absolutely. Oh my goodness. If I could direct everyone to an amazing image in the collection of the Smithsonian American Art Museum. It is, um, I believe by Huerta, uh, an image of the Raisin Girl, like the California Raisin Girl, but she looks like a skeleton and uh, it's a, a commentary on uh, the boycott of grapes. It's a commentary on uh, the contamination of water for a lot of grape workers in California. It's an amazing image that once you see it, you will never forget it. So I believe it's by Huerta. It's of the California Grape Girl and it's in the collection of the Smithsonian American Art Museum. Okay, I'm sure Tracy or Anne okay. has looking for it right now. <laughs> um, so let's see. So, uh, oh, Tom, th this is interesting. He's mentioning, you know, do people know that there are many amazing fruits loved in other parts of the world that never make it to the general American market? Um, yeah, I mean, this project has definitely made me more experimental in what I'm trying. You know, I go to the grocery store now and um, the, the pitfall of my project is that I can never stop researching, right? I go to the grocery store and I'm like constantly thinking about my research. It's not just like me shopping at the grocery store anymore, but it's also made me more experimental in trying different foods, trying different fruits. And um, there are certainly a number of even just like different varieties of the banana that I've tried that I probably uh, wouldn't have been encouraged to do until I started working on this research. Right. Um, yeah, so I mean, I think that, you know, in terms of like our poll question at the beginning, based on some of the things people were saying, and, you know, even the stories that we were talking about when we first encountered certain fruits. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's something that we sometimes completely forget about that people are eating different things in different places. Also, quick shout out to Sarah, thank you. It's actually a work by Esther Hernandez. That's the work I'm talking about, um, about the California grape and raisin girl. So thank you for putting that in our chat. Yes, Sarah, thank you. Um, and so Cheryl is asking more about major collections of 19th century trade cards and um, Diane did uh, include some, I don't know, you know, the Clements, we have some, but they're not well cataloged at this okay. point. So um, if anybody is coming to research at the Clements and has questions about that, I'm sure Clayton's always happy to answer them. But where else did you uh, find those collections, Shana? So the major collections that I studied were at Winterthur in Delaware, and they have great fellowship opportunities for those who want to study at their archives. The American Antiquarian Society has also a tremendous collection. Again, the Schlesinger at Harvard. Um, trade cards, if I could just take a moment to advocate for studying them. You know, in my field in art history, a lot of scholars want to study the high art, the capital A art, the paintings, the sculptures. Those were for more exclusive elite audiences. But if you really want to study American culture and American history, the more mainstream artifacts are trade cards. The more mainstream artifacts are like food advertisements or still life representations. So I think it's so important that we encourage students and scholars to study these objects more because they are such useful artifacts for understanding what most Americans were looking at and not just smaller groups, the few. Um, Cheryl is noting that she's surprised how few collections she finds in the West. Oh, that reminds me, Cheryl. Another great collection is actually in California. It's at the Huntington. Um, the Huntington Library has the J.T. Last collection, and they have an incredible uh, plethora of print advertisements and trade cards. So definitely consider the Huntington, too. All right. So one last question, uh, Francis is wondering, is it possible to think that the Boston Dental Society would have been encouraging the black community to care for their teeth? She said she's not defending the image, but just sure. trying to imagine other intents. 
Francis, that is such a great question. I think that it is really useful to consider, is there any possibility that these images were just not all degrading, right? Is there any way, any possibility that maybe these were directed to black consumers or you know, useful to someone in trying to encourage um, you know, something positive? But I can tell you that after seeing hundreds and hundreds of racist watermelon images, there is no doubt in my mind that there is like so little room in these images for anything more benevolent or more positive. Like they were really just designed to mock or um, you know make fun of and denigrate African American people. And even if they considered it to be a little more lighthearted, you know the the consequences are devastating. There's one scholar, uh, Kyla Tompkins, who tries to consider how might uh, you know. Black consumers have reacted to these trade cards or how might the trade card industry have um, throughout the 19th century been more and more marketed toward uh, rising black consumership. And I think these questions are so valuable. So I'm really appreciative that you asked that. Thank you. Do you have any um, last thoughts after all of these questions that you'd like to bring up? Um, gosh, I would just like want to thank everyone for paying attention and being interested in my work. If I could also direct you to, um, you know, my Kent State profile page, you can learn more about some upcoming talks and also my Instagram page at the Fruits of Empire. Every week I post a new image and I discuss the image. So if you want to continue the conversation, I would love to talk more about my research, answer more questions or get more feedback. So you can find me at the Fruits of Empire on Instagram or contact me through my faculty profile. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, I think we all have a lot, a lot to think about. Um, so thank you for bringing all of this to the foreground. And thanks everybody for joining us today. We really appreciate it and have a great weekend. Thank you everyone. Bye. So